The delight in store today uh, is uh, a, a talk from uh, Professor Luis Fraga. Uh, Professor Fraga has come back to Notre Dame. Uh, he was here as a, a junior faculty member um, a little while ago, not that many years ago. I won't embarrass him by saying how long. Uh, and then he moved from here uh, to Stanford uh, and then on to uh, Washington University in Seattle and returned to Notre Dame last year uh, and is now co-director with Professor Matavina of the Institute of Latino Studies. He holds the Arthur Foundation Endowed Chair in Transformative Latino Leadership and he is, of course, in, in the Department of Political Science and a fellow of the Institute for Educational Initiatives. He's the author or co-author of five books, uh, the most recent of which, I hope this is still right, is from Cambridge University Press in 2012, a collection on Latinos in the new millennium, an almanac of opinion, behavior, and policy preferences. Uh, he's also uh, authored over three dozen academic articles and book chapters on issues in Latino politics, in voting rights, in immigration policy, and educational politics. He's not a bad teacher. He's received 15 awards for teaching, mentoring, and advising over his career so far, uh, and two awards for his work in Catholic education. In 2011, he was named by President Obama to serve on the Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, and he is, for that uh, commission, one of the co-chairs of its subcommittee on post-secondary education. And also in 2011, he was named one of the top 100 influentials in the country by Hispanic Business Magazine. Well, I don't know how you gauge influence, but clearly in terms of success, uh, he has done it all. I'm delighted to welcome him to speak to us today about the changing American voter in 2016 and beyond. Professor Fraga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for that uh, very generous introduction. And uh, my thanks to all of you for being here on this uh, beautiful South Bend um, afternoon. Um, you're getting a full taste of what South Bend is like for those of us who live here. We're not particularly surprised. I would like to also acknowledge and thank uh, friends and colleagues uh, who are here in the audience and especially my wife, Charlene Aguilar, who's here um, and um, still returns, still returns to hear me speak. Um, I have a friend uh, from another university who said, gosh, you know, your wife still smiles when you speak. My, my, mine hasn't done that in 10 years. I said, okay. Um, and lastly, I want to thank uh, Gabriela Malespin, an undergraduate student here, for helping me uh, gather a lot of the data that I will use uh, for my talk. She is a um, scholar here, a student scholar from uh, Puerto Rico, who's here with the support of um, a very generous um, donor and um, supporter of um, Notre Dame. So I feel especially qualified to give this talk um, to you today. I'm a political scientist who has studied the complex interaction of demographics and the evolution of American politics for now over 30 years, and I'm privileged to hold, as was said, an endowed chair here. Perhaps more importantly, uh, related to our football game here, I am a native Texan and the uh, brother of two Longhorns, uh, <laughs> my older brother and my younger sister. Uh, but I'm also the father of our daughter, Isabel, who is a double domer, and soon to be a triple domer. Um, so I believe I have, uh, yes, a variety of, uh, of interests and uh, capacities to speak with you today. I love competition. I love working hard. I love dealing with pressure. I love having the opportunity to build. But my fundamental purpose in sharing some reflections with you today is a bit counterintuitive. Elections are largely understood, and we're going to talk about changes in the American electorate. Elections are largely understood as competitive contests. Seems appropriate that we be talking about competitive contests on an Notre Dame football Saturday. 
But what I'd like to do with you today and the reflections that I would like to share with you today is what I hope will be a deeper look and a more self-reflective look on the privilege and responsibility to use elections, especially the 2016 election, to hold ourselves as voters and as citizens of this country to standards much higher than just winning. Yes, elections are about winning, but too often, I think it's fair to say, elections are understood just about winning and just about losing. I want to use this opportunity to speak with you today, I think in the best traditions of Notre Dame, the University of Our Lady, as grounded in her everlasting devotion, love, and example of giving, of sacrifice, of searching, and finding the peace and self-confidence to affect, through our own vote choices, what kind of a nation we want to be and what kind of a nation we want to leave, even more importantly, to our children and our grandchildren, the greatest treasures from our Lord who are entrusted to us. I want to talk about demographic change in the United States. We are living today, we are all living today, through one of the greatest demographic transformations in American history. Now, the United States has experienced such demographic transformations in the past. I want to address with you in what ways today's demographic transformations are different and how they have already, as well as how they are likely to affect our politics and policymaking in 2016 and beyond. Many of you have seen charts similar to this. This is a chart from 1970 to two projections out to 2050, the data are accurate, up through 2010, of racial and ethnic demographic change in the United States. This white line is of those who are Caucasian, European American, European origin, whatever term one would like to use. The red line here is of African Americans, the green line of Latinos and Hispanics, and this yellow line is of people who are of Asian or Pacific Islander descent. What you can see is that we are right in the middle, based on the 2010 census, of a series of patterns of demographic shift that are quite dramatic when one looks through the lens of race and ethnicity. Notice that much of the shift that is occurring is a shift that combines the decline in the percentage that of those who are of European origin with an increase in the percentage of those who are Latino. And notice as well that perhaps by the year 2040, some are now putting it closer to 2035, a there will not be a majority of any particular racial or ethnic group in the United States. 2040, I submit to you, is only, is only 25 years away. Now, I won't be around to see that shift. Many of us, perhaps, in this room will not be around, but certainly our children and our grandchildren, especially, will be around during that period of time. Our country is shifting in some very significant, and I think it's fair to say, fundamentally different ways. Now, to further understand the nature of this demographic shift, I want to show you a map of the growth of the Latino population over the last 30 years. This is a map of the concentration of Latinos living in the United States. This is California, the Los Angeles area. The size, if you will, of each of these little bubbles gives you a sense. This is the, the uh, index that you can use here, the legend that you can use here to understand it. The larger the circle, the higher the concentration of people. The um, darker the circle, the greater the concentration of people as well. This is a map of Hispanics in the United States in 1980. California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Chicago, not surprisingly, are areas of major concentration. I'd like to take you through maps that help us understand that growth over the next 30 years. 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. Again, 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. What do these maps and these indicators show? 
It shows that not only are Latinos growing, as our previous slide indicated, as a percent of the national population, they have grown especially significantly in areas of the South, in areas of the Midwest, and in areas of the Pacific Northwest, and frankly, almost everywhere across the country. The demographic shifts that we are seeing, in other words, are not just shifts in total numbers. They are shifts in where more diverse people are living, and it's just about everywhere across the country. Notice, those shifts that are occurring in the South and the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest are happening simultaneously to increasing concentrations in traditional areas of Latino population growth, like California, like Texas, like Florida, like New York, and like Illinois. At present, there are four, if you'll permit me to use the term, majority-minority, by that I mean non-white, non-European origin states, in the United States today. California, Hawaii, New Mexico, and Texas are now majority-minority states. In the next five years, to that list of four, we would add, if projections continue, we would add the states of Maryland and Nevada. Into the 2020s, we would add Arizona, we would add Florida, we would add Georgia and New Jersey. In the 2030s, we would add Alabama, we would add Louisiana and New York. In the 2040s, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Michigan, Oklahoma, and Virginia. By 2060, again, if our projections are accurate, a total of 22 states in the United States will be majority minority states. And those 22 states will capture two thirds of the nation's population. Well, what does this mean? And why think in racial ethnic terms? And what can we begin to understand from this demographic shift about its implications for politics, for voting, and especially for the opportunities that we have? And that's the key challenge that I want to present to you today, the opportunities that we have to decide what kind of a nation we want to be, and how just, and how fair, and how inclusive, and how free, and how prosperous a nation we want to be. Just a few more demographic facts. Latinos are growing as a percent of our national population, but look at the largest concentration of Latinos. It's of individuals, of children who are under the ages of 15 to 19. Notice how different that is to the population and distribution of whites currently living within the United States, where the largest groupings are of individuals between the ages of um, roughly 45 to 54. We might include folks all the way up to age of 59. I'm 60, so I would be, I guess, over here in this little group right here, um, in this group. The growth in the population and the geographic dispersion is reflective also of a much younger population. That's not just the case with regards to Latinos. If you look at the median age of, uh, of our groups that are growing as a segment of the population and compare them to groups that have been in the country much longer, the median age of whites is 42.8. For Asians and Asian Americans, 36. For African Americans, 33. But for Latinos, it's lowest at the age of 28. Latinos are not the only group that is noticeably younger. And it's very important to remember that of all Latinos living in the United States today who are under the age of 18, 93%, repeat myself, of all Latinos living in the United States today under the age of 18, 93% are born in the United States and are American citizens. It's a very interesting way in which the Latino population is simultaneously a population of immigrants and a population of those who are US born. But the nation as a whole, in these data that are taken from a particular report that is based upon the current population survey, the nation is overall becoming older. If you look at the national trends, if you will, of our age distribution, those who are 65 and older have grown as a percent of, of the population, as other groups have. But if you project out, 
we're going to continue to be an aging population. U.S. population, the demographic patterns by age of the United States population, coincide with a growing segment of the population, like Asians, like African Americans, but especially Latinos, that are a much younger population. So this is another very interesting demographic trend that we need to think about and that we need to think through and that I think has some rather significant implications for how we understand our responsibilities as citizens and especially our responsibilities as voters. Just a couple of other, a couple of other charts. I should be honest with you. When I say just a couple of others, um, it's probably not true. Um, when I was in college, I uh, did a telephone, 45 minute uh, telephone interviews for the Boston Globe um, uh, on, on a survey uh, that they wanted about political attitudes and behavior um, of people in the Boston metropolitan area. Um, um, I hope anyone here from Boston, from Massachusetts, um, fo folks from Massachusetts, we all love folks from Massachusetts. Um, folks from Massachusetts um, have a particular reputation for how they drive, um, shall we say. They're, they are known to be uh, slightly aggressive. Um, nothing compared to how aggressive they are on the telephone. When you call and ask them to submit themselves to a 45-minute telephone interview, now how do you keep someone on the phone for 45 minutes? They ask you, okay, I'll answer your questions. How long is this going to take? And you say, well, it's just, I just have a few questions. And so you go through your questions. And then when after 20 minutes they said, I thought you said it was just a few questions. You then say, and they ask you, well, how much longer is this going to be? And of course your response is, I, I just have a few more questions. And so you keep them on the phone for another 15 minutes. And then they tell you that the child has fallen down the stairs. <laughs> and grandmother has you know, broken her leg and they absolutely have to get off the phone and they said, you lied to me and they hang up the phone and bang it down. So how do you complete your interview? So you call them back up in a very kind voice and you say, I, I, I know you're busy, I'm very sorry, but um, I'm a student, which I was, I'm a student and I don't get paid unless I have a complete interview. Um, would you please let me ask you, the last few questions that I have to ask. And you then keep them on for the whole time. Okay, so what's very important to understand about the nature of this change in generation and aging of the population is that, if you will, what, what a, my uh, colleague in the Department of Political Science, um, uh, Ricardo Ramirez, in his book, Mobilizing Opportunities, refers to as political baptism. The political baptism, the generation, if you will, the greatest generation is the generation of my parents, right? The World War II generation, the silent majority generation, the baby boomer generation that I'm part of, Generation X, the millennials, the post-millennials one, post-millennials two, because we, we couldn't think of any other terms to give them, right? <laughs> post-millennial ones, post-millennial twos. What, what, you're see, what these data indicate is that, not surprisingly, as our population is aging, even though our population is aging, the political influences that may have affected their lives are beginning to shift as well. So although there is a shift in age that's coinciding with this demographic shift by race and ethnicity, the shift by age is bringing in people who have different sets of political experiences, if you will, different sets of political socialization experiences. Just a couple more charts. There's generational, you should laugh, generational diversification as well. When you look at those generations, the greatest generation, the silent majority, the same generations I just showed in the previous slide, what percent of them, what percent of them are made up of different racial ethnic segments of our population? And here you see a very interesting pattern, whereby the post-millennial generation, it is clear that a minority of the post millennial third generation are in fact comprised of Caucasians, is comprised of whites. As our nation becomes more diverse, the point I'm trying to make is, as our nation becomes more diverse, the generational impact is beginning to reflect more the overall shift that we're seeing in the demographic makeup of, of the population. Now, 
What's driving much of this shift? Well, very simply, it is the type of child that is being born in the United States. This is a calculation of the racial ethnic background of children born in the United States from 1980 to, and projected out to 2060. This is the percentage of children in the country as a whole who are, if you will, white, European American. This is the percent who are born to people who would classify themselves as members of ethnic racial minority groups. And what you can see is that this term majority and minority gets much more confusing for our younger generation. And who the majority is and who the minority is gets much more confusing, not confusing in a bad sense, but rather confusing in the sense of thinking along these terms of majority and minority consistent with our historical past. So what do I want you to conclude from these slides, these nice color slides, what I want you to consider is that racial ethnic shifts and generational shifts and political socialization shifts are happening right now and are only going to continue. What we decide now, how we decide to see ourselves, how we see our country, how we exercise our responsibilities as voters, as leaders in structuring opportunities and life chances for subsequent generations matters a great deal now. Changes related to age, class status, gender, race, ethnicity, geography, and income inequality, it's extremely troubling set of figures for our country, have direct implications for how we understand ourselves and our responsibilities. Well, this is supposed to be about elections and politics. This talk is supposed to be about election and politics. Well, what implications do these demographic changes have for how we vote, for how we voted in the recent past, and for how we're likely to vote in the future? How have these changes affected our politics, and how are they likely to affect our politics in the future? Just a couple more slides. You should laugh again. This is a slide that only a social scientist can love. This is a slide that is trying to help us better understand over the course of time from 1980, projected out to 2060, of the difference between Amer people living in the United States who are of voting age, above the age of 18, and whether or not they're actually eligible to vote. So it's trying to compare the overall demographic shifts to actually who is a citizen and who's therefore able to qualify to vote. A flat line here at the zero is an indication that the age distribution of a particular racial ethnic group, this is the line here for um, African Americans, that the age distribution, those above the age of 18, is roughly equal to those who are qualified to vote as American citizens should they choose to do so. Notice how distinct the lines are here for Asians and others, and especially for the largest and fastest growing ethnic racial group, Hispanic. It's a way of thinking of overrepresentation and underrepresentation, and where we are now in our um, um, time here in, 20, um, in 2015. There's a mismatch, if you want to think of it that way. There's a mismatch. Well, why such a significant mismatch for Asians and especially for Latinos? It's a little thing called immigration. And the way in which substantial portions of our population growth as those of us who are Latino, those of us who are Asian, the way in which that growth is in part, not exclusively, in part driven by immigration. This is a chart that tries to do the same sort of analysis and provide a similar sort of understanding of the difference between share of the population of citizens within each of these distinct racial ethnic groups, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, and whites, citizens, all of these are citizens, non-citizens are taken out, and the share of those who actually vote in elections, national elections, both uh, presidential elections and off-year congressional elections from 1954 to 2014. You should notice who made this graph. It's, it's our son, um, Bernard Fraga, who's a third year assistant professor at Indiana University. He 
didn't come to Notre Dame. He didn't go to the University of Texas. He actually went to Stanford when we were at Stanford and then got his PhD from Harvard, doing very well. This came out in a post that he had um, in, the, uh, in a um, page that he had on the Washington Post. What these data are trying to get us to see is that the mismatch, if you will, of share of the citizen population and voters as Latinos and Asians have become larger percentages of the American public, the disparity between citizenship and actual voting is growing. If you will, the gap between growth in citizens, we talked about population overall just a minute ago, the growth in citizens and actual participation has even a greater gap in the United States than we might think would be the case or should be the case. Notice that for African Americans, this disparity is virtually non-existent. And notice that for those who are white, relative as a percent of the electorate, they are participating at much higher rates and have, if you will, constitute a higher percentage of the overall national vote than you would expect given their percent of the population. One other way to think of this, and again applying this to Latinos, is to understand the growth in the Latino population that is now of citizen population, 25.1%, and what the, the number of Latinos is who's actually registered to vote. As the population of citizens has grown, the gap between eligibility and actual registration has actually continued to grow. Now, one estimate is that there were, of course, 12.2 million eligible Latinos who didn't vote. Now, this is also just a graph that only a social scientist can love. Now, it's nice to know something about demographic shift. It's nice to know something about demographic change and age and so forth. It's nice to understand challenges related to participation, challenges related to um, voting and registration, but at some point, and I hope a number of you um, in the audience are thinking, uh, Professor Fraga, uh, you've got it all wrong. Elections are about margins. Elections are not about overall patterns of participation. Elections are about beating your opponent, not understanding larger trends in society. They're about who wins and who loses. Well, this graph, picking out the vote for um, sen then Senator Kerry and incumbent um, Democrat uh, Senator Kerry from Massachusetts, um, incumbent president in 2004, um, George um, W. Bush, I want you to see how the demographic shifts that I referred to earlier, and I want you to see how despite the demographic shifts, and despite the low participation rates, the changes in demography and the, change, the related changes in partisan preferences are, are already affecting our elections today because it's about the margins. This is a chart that shows you what the not only racial distribution of the electorate is in terms of preferences, this is the national vote for the incumbent, President Bush, in the 24 election, and the national vote for John Kerry. The line here, the light blue line, is white voters, estimates of white voters based upon exit polls and registration rates. The yellow line, estimates of Asian Pacific Islander voters. The darker lines, estimates of African American voters. The orange lines, estimates of um, Latino voters. So you have to understand not just the group as a whole, but who they tend to support. There's an argument to be made here that the reason President Bush could claim that he was the national first choice preference of all the voters who participated in the 2004 election is, of course, because of the tremendous support he received from white voters, but notice the critically important support that he received from a cross-section of Latino, African American, and Asian voters as well. Not as significant as the democratic support given by Latino voters, certainly nothing compared to the upwards of 90% African American support received by John Kerry, the Democrat, 
and the slightly greater percent of support received by Asian voters. But notice how the split in the white vote was almost made up by the ethnic racial vote. And notice how it was in the 2004 election. The Republican candidate nationally who had, who had the advantage, if you will, in claiming receiving more national votes. Very quickly, this is the distribution of votes in California. Kerry lost the white vote in California. This is the tremendous growth in the Latino population and, and consistent dem, um, democratic preferences, upwards of 70% of Latino voters in California. California is now one of the most demo, um, democratic states in the country. Historically, it had been mostly Republican. Why? Because of the growth in the Latino population and its preference for democratic candidates. This is the chart for New Jersey, which also shows that Latino voters and African American voters combined were critical contributors to, given the distribution of the white vote, critical contributors to John Kerry winning. Just a couple more. This is the vote in Florida. George Bush wins Florida. Why? Because of the Latino Republican vote. George Bush wins in New Mexico because of the Latino Republican vote, although most Latinos in New Mexico voted Democrat. The combination of Caucasian and Latino support gave him that particular victory. Look at Nevada and the importance of the Latino vote for both Democrat and Republican, but especially for the incumbent president, George Bush, that is indicated here. Two states went Democrat because of the Latino vote, California and New Jersey, combined with the African American vote, and of course their white um, allies' votes as well. But three votes in 2004 went, three states, excuse me, went for George W. Bush, Florida, Nevada, and New Mexico, as I, as I just showed you. This is the vote in Texas. We have to look at Texas. Much was made of how much support George Bush in 2004 received from Latino voters, one of the highest rates ever, estimated at about 40%. How important was that vote to his margin of victory? He received so much support from Caucasian voters, his growth, which was substantial, was not directly relevant to his winning, but it certainly contributed to his overall margin. What are these data showing you? They're showing you that even with lower participation rates, the increased participation that does exist can be important in affecting the outcome of national elections. These are states where the Latino vote swung the state for the winning candidate, or at least a claim can be made. But the important point that I want you to see is the following. Our demographic shifts combine with partisan preferences of all different segments of the population. And in combining with all different segments of the population, we are in a position to very clearly understand how this demographic shift is already affecting who wins and who loses in our national politics. Now, these data, and especially the extent to which Latinos were important to um, George uh, W. Bush, might lead you to think that Latinos had permanently shifted their preferences to a sizable degree for the Republicans, but notice what happened in 2008 and 2012. No state, no state swung in favor of the Republican candidate. These are some states and some data that gives you a sense of what the margin of victory was in our last 2012 election. What percent of the state is comprised of people who are non-European and what the number of electoral votes were that went to the winning candidate? The states where the minority vote was decisive in the 2012 election, these are the four most obvious states where minority influence accounted for 69 electoral votes. These are states, these five states here, New Mexico, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, that in addition to the four I previously described, comprising 126 electoral votes, where given the margin of victory and given the percent minority in the population and their participation rates, these states swung appropriately because of those votes. If you will, building on the four, there were an additional five comprising 126 electoral votes. This is an estimate of the likely influence of these different cross-sections of the population in 2016. And what we see here is 
that it is possible that nine states, Colorado, Florida, New Mexico, Nevada, Ohio, and Virginia for African Americans, Colorado, Florida, New Mexico, and Nevada for Latinos, and minority combined, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, perhaps on the horizon, North Carolina and Arizona, as many as 152 electoral votes might swing depending on what minority preferences happen to be. What does this all mean and what am I trying to say with these data? Both parties have an incentive to think of gathering more votes from distinct ethnic racial segments of the population, but already African Americans and Latinos and others with their allies have shown that the Democratic Party is likely to benefit, but depending on the candidate and the platform, the Republican Party can be a player with this segment of the electorate as well. We might conclude that in fact, noticeable inclusion across racial ethnic lines has already occurred. But there's a very interesting paradox that I'd like to note for you, a very interesting paradox of inclusion of parties trying to gather more votes from the changing demographics of the country, both parties trying to gather more votes that I'd like to offer to you and suggest to you. I've got just about five minutes and we'll leave plenty of time for questions. You shouldn't believe anything I say about that. That's a joke. <laughs> if you're listening, you don't know. One author, now at the University of California, uh, now at Princeton actually, he was at the University of California, San Diego for a while, um, noted that the propensity of African Americans to support the Democratic Party has been um, um, championed by the Democratic Party for years and years and years, continues to be an extremely important contributor to um, the electoral victories of uh, Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. But a risk that a group takes in just supporting one particular political party overwhelmingly is that they may in fact be captured. We know you'll vote for us you have no other choice. The other folks, these are, this is my phrasing. We know you will vote for us. You have no other choice. Therefore, we can take you for granted. We don't have to pursue policies that actually serve your interests because you're so aligned with who we are. On national averages, except in the state of Florida, approximately 60 to 70 percent of Latinos tend to support Democrats, upwards of 90 percent of of uh, African Americans um, support Democrats. One of the interesting ironies of greater inclusion is that yes, people want your vote, but they don't necessarily have to provide you with benefits as a result of that vote if they know you're never gonna vote for the other party. Another counterintuitive paradox of inclusion is a strategy that was pursued, I think it's fair to say, by President Bush, especially effectively in um, 2000 and, and even more in 2004, where he did something that no Democratic candidate had ever done. He went out and actively respected Latino voters. And he positioned himself as someone who was sympathetic to, who understood, who respected and appreciated the values of hard work, the values of family, the values of military service, so prevalent in many Latino families. And he said, I understand you because I'm from Texas. I respect you, your commitment to hard work, sacrifice, family, country, and community. Support me. I understand you. But very similar to what happens with electoral capture under Democrats, the actual public policy gains that result from this type of symbolic mainstreaming, you're part of America, I know you, I understand you, the policy benefits are also few and far between. Notice what I'm saying here. It applies to both political parties, but with different positions that they take. And we've seen this already despite the patterns that I identified for you of limited participation. But there's a third response of greater inclusion that, we, that, that, that is possible as well, a third paradox, is, if you will, and I'm going to refer to that as policy targeting. Policy targeting says that you're a threat to our national culture, 
You're a threat to our language. You're a threat to our identity. You use too many social services. You violate the rule of law. And too many of you are here. In the case of Latinos and some Asians and others, the, the term often used is illegal aliens. You violated the law, you're here illegally. Absolutely true. Under the law, much more complex if one takes a step back and understands the demands for labor that exists within the United States as a result of the internationalization of capital and the way in which that internationalization has led to tremendous amounts of economic restructuring in home countries. If you will, the greater presence and influence that voters of color have also can make them targets at the same time for negative, vitriolic, nasty campaigning, depending on how you strategically decide which segments of the electorate you want to get support from. What are some examples of this? Proposition 187 in California it was called the Save Our State Initiative that uh, limited uh, access even to education for um, young children who were not there uh, in uh, documented status, especially social services. House Resolution 4437, the Sensenbrenner Bill in 2006. Under the Obama administration, there has been an emphasis on enforcement of deportation of criminals. It's led to 400,000 deportations of people, two-thirds to three-quarters of whom had no serious criminal violation at all other than not having a piece of paper that said they came into the United States under the current rules and procedures. Senate Bill 1070, um, and uh, very similar to Proposition 187 in Arizona, declared largely unconstitutional, and a recent decision by the Supreme Court in Shelby v. Holder I'm, use, I'm offering as another example where the law that led to increases in participation of African Americans is now considered by a majority of our Supreme Court unconstitutional because certain formulas that allowed for coverage are not updated. The point that I want you to see here is there are many different parts States, national government, Congress, members of Congress, states, even the Supreme Court, where there seems to be evidence that policy targeting is occurring at the same time that groups are more and more important to our electoral outcomes. How do we come to understand, then, the choices that we have within this set of what seem to be fundamental contradictions? Things that we just wouldn't predict would be the case. One way to understand what is happening here is that change is in fact reshaping American politics. Non-white influence in national and state electoral politics is only increasing, we've talked about that. These voters can be determinative in elections for both parties, we talked about that, depends on the vote distribution of others. But the paradox of inclusion suggests counterintuitively that greater political incorporation, however limited, could result in greater policy marginalization through capture, symbolic mainstreaming, and policy targeting. And notice that according to the examples I've given you here, by both political parties, by both. So what does this all mean? And what can I say in conclusion? What I think it all means is that elections need to increasingly be understood by us as expressions of what vision we have for our nation's future. They are expressions of how self-confident we are in the integrative capacity of America's social, economic, and especially political institutions. And they are certainly reflective of the kind of legacy we choose to leave to our children and our grandchildren. This is a quote from Harvard um, law professor uh, for most of his professional career, uh, Roberto Mangabeira Unger and, and uh, Cornell West, uh, professor of religious studies and African American studies at, uh, at Princeton University. It comes from a book they wrote and reads as follows. To understand your country, you must love it. To love it, you must, in a sense, accept it. To accept it as it is, however, is to betray it. To accept your country without betraying it, you must love it for that in it which shows what it might become. Very interesting challenge to us. 
My father was in the Navy during World War II. He originally enlisted as a censor, listening, he was bilingual, biliterate, listening to phone conversations going on between Mexico uh, and the United States. And when someone would speculate about uh, where their son was going to be shipped or where their daughter might go to serve in a, in a, medical, capa in a medical care capacity, um, he would cut off the phone conversation and said, you can't talk about that because um, the enemies of the country at that time might be listening to it. My mom was a telephone operator, that's how they met. Um, kind of a nice love story. Their generation, what has been described as the greatest generation, their generation understood that the best in our country was possible. And they lived through what happened when the best in our country was allowed, I think, to appear. And their expectations of what was best in the country was grounded in a very deep faith in our nation's capacity to grow and prosper more than it ever has in the past. Now, they may not have lived that prosperity. It may have taken another generation, but that faith was very clear, very deep, they understood what it was in it, which shows what it might become. These are sobering data of how much further we still have to go. These are the numbers, estimates of the numbers, and the percentages of each racial ethnic group of children who live in poverty. Poverty in the United States, according to formal government statistics, is living in a family of four with an income of less than $23,517 a year. This is the percent of all children, one out of five, who lives in a circumstance of that sort, 39%, almost 40% of African Americans, 37% of American Indians, 33% of Latino Hispanics, 23% of those of two or more races, 14% of Asian Pacific Islanders and of Caucasian children. We're a funny country in being very comfortable, allowing and forcing children to be held responsible for the life chances of their parents. I wonder whether or not we might do a better job and how might we do a better job as a country in providing opportunities to children who have no responsibility for their circumstances through our voting, through our elections, given the types of demographic shifts that are occurring. To conclude, and this is really true, I want you to look at the figure that I started my talk with. Decline in the white population, African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. Notice what's happening to these lines in the relatively near future. They're all coming together. Might it be the case that the directions of the line coming together, the lines coming together, allows us to ask questions like the following. Are we a nation that emphasizes our divisions, our conflicts, and what makes us different from one another? Or are we a nation that understands itself, that within us which shows us what we might become, to rephrase Unger and West, grounded in an understanding of our lines coming together, linked fate and common destiny? Might we, as individuals driven in our vote choices, whatever our ethnic racial backgrounds, be driven by choices of what is best in us? Or do we allow our choices and our actions to be driven by what we know are not our highest values, ideals, and beliefs? What would we, in explaining our vote choices, what would we be proud to leave as a legacy of our politics to our children and our grandchildren when we are no longer here? My friends, I thank God every day that at this stage in my career, I work and serve and grow at Notre Dame. This is an institution as inspired by Our Lady and her devotion, love, and example where we can ask questions like this in our intellectual work and frankly where I think increasingly we must ask questions like this. If you believe in providence, that God's hands are forever directing our lives in ways that we cannot fully understand, might it not be the case that we embrace the changes, choices, and responsibilities that I've discussed with you this afternoon, if you'll permit me, 
as part of God's plan to give us the chance to build the type of fair, equitable, free, inclusive, and just society that perhaps we all know if we let ourselves know it, that God wants us to build. My prayer for all of us here today is that we all look to Our Lady for our inspiration to answer these questions that I have posed. Thank you for your attention, and go Irish. a full 20 minutes for questions. We've got five. Um, <laughs> but you didn't, many of you didn't leave, so I'll take that as a, as a reasonable sign. I'm very happy to take your questions, please. Yes. Graph. Yes. Now, when people are, there's, there's a lot of biracial oh, and mixed ethnicity. So when yeah. they are asked, yeah. Yeah. are you talking yeah. If we, is that why this, this, this also yeah. Very interesting. Most of our biracial identifiers, not all, but most, overwhelming majority, are a combination of one of these groups with whites. So as that population increases, the decline in whites is going to be more severe. And there's going to be another line, and just that the numbers haven't been around. It's only since 2000 that people were allowed to indicate two or more races. We have some data here. It's about 4%, roughly, depending on how you count two and a half to four percent of the population. Very important to keep one thing in mind. Although a person is, bi if you'll permit the term, biracial, right? You know, has a parent who's of one particular racial ethnic background and a parent who's of another. How do they identify? How does Barack Obama identify? White mother, right? And uh, African father. Does he identify as biracial? He identify as African American? Does he identify as both? Or does it depend upon the context that he's in? And whether he's speaking to this constituency or this constituency or attending church here or attending church there, kind of like all of us who have all these multiple identities and we pick our identities in particular circumstances. Well, some people say that the, the, the multiracialism that is increasing is gonna, gonna suggest that these categories don't matter. I'm not so sure about that. I just think they'll get more interesting and more complicated in certain ways. Yeah, question here. What I find troubling about a lot of your talk, and, and not you per se, but our whole generation today, I was raised when I think it was kind of the Martin Luther King era, where the goal was to be, you were valued by the content of your heart, not the color of your skin. Yeah, yeah. And it seems to me as though we've actually gone backwards. Yeah. To yeah. where we are more racially focused than when I was my son's age. Yeah. And yeah. I would like to think that at the end of the day, all those demographic groups have the same goals. I mean, yeah. we all want security, all, we all want a job, we all want to raise a family. And why should the color of your skin matter? And I, and, and I just seems like we're focusing more and more on race yeah. instead of less and less on what Martin Luther yeah. King spoke about. Yeah, yeah. Well, Martin Luther King was, um, Amazing in his ability to simultaneously say, skin color doesn't matter, but boy, it matters now, and it's going to matter for the next five to six to eight decades in the future, because you have to have an understanding of limited opportunity and who has more limited opportunities than others to be able to then reach that point in our future which I think all of us would agree, where these distinctions don't matter. But oftentimes, we find his hopeful vision so inspiring that we forget about all of his other work that said, we have to speak truth to power. And we have to call discrimination when we see it discrimination. And we have to call racism when we see it racism. And we have to call lack of economic opportunity, lack of economic opportunity, and work to change that, and work to change that. I wonder whether or not 
our capacity to reach that very worthy goal has diminished when we just focus on the hope and the goal, which we can all support, and not all of the hard work that has to happen in the means, the tough judgments. I wonder whether or not our focus here more, my focus, is in fact to make us, to put us in a position to better reach that vision that we all, I think, aspire to. One more question? One last question. <laughs> One last question. One last question. One last question. I'm sorry. One last question. Yes, Nacho. Nacho is on the advisory council and a very generous donor to the university. <laughs> The Institute for Latino Studies that Tim Matomina and I are going to so, so I'm not going to, not, to deny Nacho Lozano the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, sorry, sorry, Peter. Back in the uh, early 20th century, during the great European migration, uh, people described themselves as Irish American or Italian American or whatever. Uh, today we describe ourselves as Latinos. When will we stop? calling ourselves Latinos, but just plain old Americans. Well, I think it's very interesting, and um, there happens to be a study that I was part of, that we're trying to finish the book now, uh, a new book on this, and um, it's one way to think of it, much. and I think, because I'm one of the authors of this perspective, I think it's the right one, right? You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> so what academics do. Right? Consider this possibility, and we've got survey data to back it up. 2006 Latino National Survey, largest state stratified survey of Latinos ever in the United States, 8,624 respondents, four generations, 15 states in the DC metropolitan area. Latinos identify strongly as Latinos with their country of origin and as Americans. The vision that we've tended to have, and I'm not sure it was ever quite accurate because we didn't have survey data during the time of the Irish and the Italians and the Czechs and the Poles and the Germans. The story that you left your home country identity behind and became this thing called American, I'm not sure it was ever quite that simple a process. I think what people did was to add identities together. And what I find very hopeful, consistent with the gentleman's question here, about our study looking at Latinos now and their understanding of themselves is that they have multiple identities and are equally committed to maintaining those identities and provide an opportunity for an appropriate balance between them. I wonder whether or not our renewed focus, we might say, on race is actually allowing us to realize the highest ideals of America as a different society than in the past. Because we might be evolving into a society where it's okay for you to be Mexican and Latino and American all at the same time and without any sense of conflict between them because you have culture, you have language, you have respect, and you have national unity too. Wouldn't that be a wonderful, wonderful reality if we finally acknowledge that you don't have to choose? You can have it all. Isn't that what the promise of America has always been, of unlimited potential and unlimited prosperity and an unlimited chance to build a country that's different than any other one in the world? 